Welcome everyone to today's special Federalist Society virtual event, where our distinguished panel is discussing court packing, term limits, and more, the debate over reforming the judiciary. This event is sponsored by our Federalism and Separation of Powers practice group, and it's being live streamed on our YouTube channel. I'm Nick Marr, Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that expressions of opinion during the event are those of our, our, of our experts. I'm just going to introduce our moderator before giving the floor to him. We're very pleased to be joined this afternoon by Mr. Ilya Shapiro, director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute and author of the recent book entitled Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nominations and the Politics of America's Highest Court. And if you buy the book and let him know, Ilya will send you a signed copy. Now he's also- I'll, a I'll send you a signed book plate in, the, in these days. Mind of, uh, you know, shut in. And while well, he's also a skilled moderator, uh, so Mr. Shapiro will introduce the rest of our panel and direct the discussion. And we'll be looking to you, the audience, for questions later in our program. So with that, Mr. Ilya Shapiro, the floor is yours. Thanks, Nick. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't make much sense. You buy the book and then you get a free signed copy. That's kind of an odd deal. But anyway, if you do want to get something free, if you go to supremedisorder.com, you can download a whole statistical historical appendix to really nerd out on all of this stuff that we're going to be discussing and make yourself really popular at your next uh, virtual cocktail party. But anyway, uh, the battles over the nominations of Merrick Garland, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett suggest that the Supreme Court is now part of the same toxic cloud that envelops all of the nation's public discourse. Politics has always played a role in judicial confirmations, but it's a modern phenomenon for divergent legal theories to map onto partisan preferences at a time when the parties are so ideologically sorted and polarized. The culmination of these trends has also led people to think of judges and justices in partisan terms and to question the legitimacy of our judiciary altogether, or at least its mode of selection and appointment. The threat of court packing was a live issue in the 2020 campaign as a potential democratic response to alleged Republican violations of the norms surrounding judicial nominations. Is there anything we can do to fix this dynamic, to uh, tone down uh, the heat uh, on Supreme Court vacancies? Reform proposals abound, term limits, politically rebalancing or changing the size of the court, setting new rules for the confirmation process and more. President-elect Joe Biden has promised to establish a bipartisan judicial reform commission. Our distinguished panel will preview the sort of discussion such a commission would likely have. And I need to thank uh, Todd Gaziano of the Pacific Legal Foundation and Ilya Soman of George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School who helped organize this event. I'll now introduce all of our panelists in the order they will speak, and then they will take it away, uh, and then I'll come back. Uh, I will moderate a, uh, a question and answer session. You will be able to type your questions into the chat box there in your Zoom, or you can raise your hand, and I will call on you, and you can uh, orally ask your question. So keep that in mind. And anyone following along in the uh, virtual sphere, uh, I think it's at FedSoc. Uh, you can also go hashtag Cato SCOTUS, uh, and we'll see what other kinds of uh, hashtags are, are trending. I don't think we have any other uh, hashtags developed, maybe hashtag judicial reform. I don't know. We'll see what organically through spontaneous order happens uh, in the Twitter sphere. Anyway, uh, Rivka Weil will kick it off. She's a professor of law at Harry Radziner Law School, part of the Interdisciplinary Center in Tel Aviv. She focuses her scholarship on constitutional, administrative, and comparative law, and has written on a host of legal topics, including most recently, a provocative article titled Court Packing as an Antidote. Before joining IDC, Rivka earned her LLM and JSD at Yale, after which she clerked for Aharon Barak, then president of the Supreme Court of Israel. James Lindgren uh, will go next. He's a professor of law at Northwestern University with a BA from Yale and a JD and a PhD in quantitative sociology from the University of Chicago. Jim has written extensively on the intersection of social science and the law, including as co-author with Federalist Society co-founder Stephen Calabresi of the seminal law review article advocating for Supreme Court term limits published in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy in 2006, nearly 15 years ago. And uh, this is the article that still remains relevant. Uh, he's now working on a paper that offers strong causal evidence for politically motivated strategic retirement by federal judges. Uh, Carrie Campbell Severino is Chief Counsel and Policy Director of the Judicial Crisis Network and co-author of the best-selling Justice on Trial, 
the Kavanaugh confirmation and the future of the court. A graduate of Duke Law, Kerry clerked for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Kerry has briefed senators and testified before Congress on the confirmation process and frequently files amicus briefs. Noah Feldman is a professor of law at Harvard University, where he teaches constitutional law and directs the Julius Rabinowitz Program on Jewish and Israeli Law. A graduate of Harvard and Yale and a Rhodes Scholar, Noah clerked for Supreme Court Justice David Souter before serving as a senior constitutional advisor to the Coalition Provisional Authority during the Iraq War. And he uh, writes on a wide range of topics ranging from conflicts in the Middle East, presidential history, globalization, and of course, the Supreme Court. So Rivka, the floor is yours. It's a pleasure to be here. And I wanted to thank you for the invitation to be part of this distinguished panel. Um, there's much discussion about judicial reform uh, of the US Supreme Court, uh, but there's not much agreement on what are the flaws of the current uh, system and what are the needed remedies. And there is a connection between the two. We need to first identify what's wrong in order to offer a remedy. And some commentators suggest that now that it is clear that there is a conservative majority on the court, a six to three majority, uh, progressives must overtake the court uh, because otherwise uh, they will not be able to promote a, in a progressive uh, agendas. Uh, such agendas will be overturned uh, by the court. Uh, some suggest we should, we should adapt a wait and see policy. Let's see what are the decisions of the court. If needed, we will threaten the court and maybe the court will take the hint and retreat like it did in the 1930s with regard to the New Deal. And if not, we will embark on judicial reform. Uh, I come uh, to this discussion from a different angle, uh, from a structural, a uh, procedural angle, and hopefully from a principled uh, uh, viewpoint. Uh, I argue that there was an abuse of the appointment power in recent years, and the remedy for the abuse of the appointment power is to use the appointment power uh, in order to neutralize the partisan takeover of the court. So I'm, I'm arguing in favor of court backing, um, but not to threaten judicial independence, not to affect a particular policy, uh, but rather to restore the legitimacy of the US Supreme Court that has been much compromised by uh, recent years, by, by the partisan takeover of the court through the abuse of the appointment process. So let me lay out the argument. Uh, I'm arguing that when you look at US history, you see that whenever a vacancy occurred during a presidential election year, always the president nominated a candidate to fill the vacancy. And this is true even if the president was a lame duck, even if the president lost elections. At the same time, the Senate interpreted its advice and consent role as such that it does not endorse the nomination, it does not confirm the nomination unless there is bipartisan consent to the nomination. Otherwise, eh, let's wait for an incoming Senate with a fresh mandate from the people. Now, I call this convention, this constitutional convention, the Scotus Bipartisan Convention, because it applies only with regard to Supreme Court appointments. This is the highest court of the land. Uh, this is the court that issues decisions that uh, have the uh, markings of uh, stardecisis. This is the court that its uh, power is not dispersed like in the lower levels. So this is the big game. Now, I'm talking about a, con a convention that was relevant in presidential election years. And I define presidential election years to include uh, all nominations within the calendar year of the presidential elections or any appointment made within 12 months prior to the president taking office. And we know that the time uh, changed over uh, the course of history as a result of the 20th Amendment. Uh, at first, uh, the president uh, went into office in March, and then uh, now it's uh, in January. Uh, when you look at the history, you see that we had a constitutional convention in the following sense. We had the practice, we had the rhetoric, and we had the rationale for the convention. So the Senate acted in conformity with this convention. There's only one case in US history prior 
to the last few years in which there was a partisan appointment to the Supreme Court during a presidential election year. And that is the case of Peter Daniel in 1841. The political actors understood the nature of the convention. They spoke its language. And um, we um, know the words that became part of the DNA of the American Republic. The Jefferson cried out uh, against midnight appointments that they are indecent, undemocratic, uh, and unfair. And uh, in terms of the rationale behind the Constitutional Convention, uh, the rationale was double fold. First of all, to protect democratic principles. It is the idea that the people should have a say on such important appointments. Um, uh, during a presidential election time, the mandate of the president is winning and it is incumbent on the Senate to make sure that uh, any appointment actually enjoys bipartisan uh, consent to, to uh, the, uh, when we are talking about appointments to the Supreme Court. In addition, the idea was to prevent an agency problem. It was to prevent an abuse of the appointment power. We know that uh, presidents want to make uh, uh, sure that the legacy continues even after they leave power. Uh, we know that presidents may embark on a, a outstanding and, and outrageous acts before they leave office. It was the uh, Senate's duty, and that, that's how the Senate saw it, uh, to make sure that no, no partisan appointment to the Supreme Court is made uh, uh, unless um, uh, that the appointment must garner bipartisan consent. Okay, so now that we have a constitutional convention, let's look at what happened in recent years. And I'm arguing that two appointments were made in a, a breach of the constitutional convention. The first is with regard to Merrick Garland. Um, in no other case um, did the Senate uh, um, not hold a vote on the merits of the candidate uh, when the nomination was made until March of a presidential election year. And we know that the Senate votes very differently on the merits of a candidate rather than on the procedural issue, whether to hold the vote. So we don't really know what would have happened if Mary Garland came to the floor. And we have to understand that the bipartisan constitutional convention applied whether it was a united government or whether it was a divided government. So the fact that it was a divided government does not matter, if at all the reverse. Uh, and the second uh, um, uh, breach of the convention was with regard to Justice Barrett uh, that was appointed within days of elections on partisan lines alone. Now, I suggest that the remedy for the breach of the constitutional convention uh, lies, uh, uh, we should use actually the appointment power to uh, remedy um, uh, the problem uh, with the abuse of the appointment power. So I'm arguing for court packing to neutralize the partisan takeover of the court. Now we know that the constitution does not dictate uh, the number of justices on the US Supreme Court. It is a matter for the statute to determine. And um, there is no problem to judicial independence uh, because uh, I'm not trying to influence a particular agenda like FDR tried to do. I'm not trying to uh, uh, change a, a certain composition of the court from one party to the other. I'm arguing on principled grounds and this should have been the position regardless of the party that enjoys uh, uh, this argument. Um, and so I'm, and, and I will make one last uh, a comment that in my article, I'm further arguing that a court packing is part of the checks and balances of the US constitution to begin with. So this is part of the design of the constitution. Uh, so with that, I'm stopping here and I will turn uh, it over to Jean. Thank you. Okay, so um, I prepared a bunch of slides, which I can't use, but I will, <laughs> I will go through them. Um, so uh, if looking at the age of the court, it's actually younger than it's been in a while. Um, uh, Justice Breyer, uh, as of January 1st, will be 82 years old, and um, uh, 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 Clarence Thomas, uh, as of January 1st, will be 72, Alito, uh, uh, just under 71. Um, and uh, a normal retirement for an American is about 62 on average. You get full, uh, full Social Security benefits at 66. Um, in academics and other kinds of fields, um, people tend to retire later in their early 70s. But by 71, 72, people are pretty much retired even from most um, 
uh, most, uh, um, uh, most high level elite jobs. Uh, the proposal that St Steve Calabrese and I made um, was for 18 year term limits. We also have a version of it for 24 year term limits if people are concerned that there's too quick a, a turnover in the court. We believe it would require a constitutional amendment. Um, for with 18 year term limits, we basically, you basically would have a slot every odd year. So the first year of a presidential administration, Biden would get one slot this coming summer and then he would get one slot in the summer of his third year. If it's a 24 year term limits, then one term you'd get two slots and uh, the next term uh, uh, the president would only get a, uh, would get a, um, uh, only the first slot. Uh, now, if 18 year term limits had been in, in force, um, um, you know, for a long time, uh, right now we would have a five, four Republican appointed court. And um, by next fall, we would have a 5-4 Democratic appointed uh, um, court. The uh, um, part of it is based, uh, part of the, the issue here is, is empirical. So between 1789 and 1970, those leaving the court on average serve 14.9 uh, years. If you exclude some at the, uh, at the very first couple of decades, um, uh, it would uh, be a bit longer. And the age at leaving, leaving office was 68 years. Um, since 1970, the average tenure has been 26.7 years and the age at leaving office is 79.6 years. And if you look just at the last nine justices to leave the court, it's still going up. They've served 28.2 years and um, the last nine justices were 80.9 uh, years, so almost 81 when they left. Um, life tenure is an aberration. There's only one state that has life tenure, Rhode Island. No other major uh, developed Western democracy has life tenure for its main constitutional court. And usually the term limits are quite short. Um, there are very few that are more than 10. There's a concern about mental decrepitude. Um, the the uh, uh, classic um, uh, work on this uh, looked at uh, and suggested that as many as 25% of the justices were losing it mentally by the time they retired. But certainly there's a loss of physical stamina and that can um, re uh, require uh, more reliance on clerks. Now, the, what, the, the primary advantage of this would be to eliminate strategic retirement for political reasons. Um, uh, we hope that it would reduce animosity and confirmation. And I have to say, you know, there have been uh, uh, pretty much most of the academics who've uh, looked at this have been positive. But among those who haven't, some of the arguments have been kind of specious. But the one that's not is it's not clear that it would reduce uh, animosity and confirmation. The idea, our idea was, uh, was that if the uh, term was 18 years rather than 30 years, 29 years, um, uh, then there would be less at stake and that would reduce animosity. Uh, Ilya, um, uh, our host, has, uh, has suggested that, that, it, um, that, it may, um, uh, that it may move the issue more to the elections uh, than it's been uh, even currently. This is a return to, uh, this would involve a return to traditional levels of judicial independence. People think that judicial independence is something that should be maximized, but uh, that's not the way the system is set up. Um, uh, the maximized independence would be the judges choose themselves, uh, like a self-perpetuating board. I mean, it certainly could be run that way, uh, but then uh, you wouldn't have the uh, democratic check at least at the outset of uh, having a political appointment. Um, it would return basically uh, tenures to more traditional levels of turnovers. Um, and every other time that we, um, that we've had a problem, major problem with people serving too long, not enough turnover, we've done something about it. In the 1830s, we added two justices. In 1869-70, we offered pensions. And in 1937, we offered senior status. Um, now, one of the things that comes up is, uh, is, is whether there's good proof that there is strategic retirement or failed strategic retirement by dying. Many political scientists and law professors have failed to find it. Um, we think um, that, uh, that they haven't modeled this very well. Um, uh, Rafe Stolzenberg, who's a quantitative sociologist at Chicago and I are working on a paper right now, which uses an experimental regression discontinuity design. 
And usually you, want, you like experiments because they give a, a much stronger causal inference. And so our experiment is basically to look at uh, the turnovers uh, when the president, uh, party of the president changes. So in 1920 election, 1932 election, um, you know, the, the 2016 election and so forth from 1920 to 2016. And to compare uh, the Republican judges uh, retiring in the year before election to retiring in the year after, uh, um, after uh, confirmation. We also do it for different time periods. And also the Democratic judges, uh, democratically appointed judges. And um, uh, one of the neat things about this is that we basically have controls where we are controlling um, of one justice against uh, one judge uh, um, against another. Now, this study doesn't look specifically at Supreme Court; it looks at all federal uh, Article Three uh, judges. But we do find a, a strong effect that is, Republicans are more likely to retire under Republican uh, uh, in the last year of Republican than they are the first year of Democratic administration. And the reverse, um, obviously, or the same, uh, uh, similar kind of pattern for for Democrats. So um, that's kind of a neat design because normally you just have controls and uh, treatment uh, people and you hope your controls are similar to your treatment. Here you have a control that's the same person. They got the same grades in law school. They have the same spouse. Um, they have the same publishing record. And the only difference is they're a year older and there's a different present. But one of the neat things about the design is the Democrats are a year older and the Republicans are a year uh, in the, for, for the, where they'd be uh, incentivized would be a year younger. So you're, uh, it actually is a nice uh, design. Now, an earlier study we did found that there was a strong pattern of retirement uh, during when the presence of the same party and you're in uh, the first or second year of a presidential administration. We also found that dying in office uh, actually was affected uh, by who was president. You're more likely to die under a president of opposing party. Um, uh, so I, the main reason, though, is to solve the sort of accidents of history that um, uh, that uh, that certain that in this case Republicans have uh, been able to uh, uh, appoint more people than Democrats, and unlike bef uh, earlier eras, uh, the Republicans are not moving as strongly to be to the liberal side as they did in earlier eras. Uh, so next is uh, Carrie Severino. Thanks so much, Professor. Um, so uh, I want to first point out that I, I, I think Professor Rifka hit the nail on the head, or Professor Rifka Weil hit the nail on the head. We need to figure out if we're looking at what these proposals are, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And I think I think Jim did a good job of talking about the the are there realities of of uh, problems with um, with uh, strategic retirement? Um, I think if we look at the general criticisms of the current system. Uh, it, they're, they're about three categories. First of all, that judges are being appointed too young or with too much focus on their philosophical purity instead of uh, to, try, to try to lock in justices of a particular philosophy for as long as possible. Um, so some people, some would say they're not looking at the more qualified judges or older candidates, um, or they're looking for people who, that are more rigid in their thought. Some people think that the current system with life tenure drives up the stakes for contentious judicial confirmation processes. Um, others would say uh, judges are acting too politically in terms of the retirement process, as, as Jim was talking, pointing out. So in order to uh, ensure having uh, philosophically compatible successors, um, which might lead to judges staying past their prime, either physically or mentally. Um, so I think on one hand, we have to figure out what of these are, are these real issues? Jim, Jim makes the argument that there is political retirement. I would just, I, I feel like I, I'm not, I don't have necessarily a dog in this fight in terms of I, I'm, I'm advocating for one particular system, but I, I'm concerned that sometimes these proposals get thrown out um, without fully analyzing what the balancing uh, concerns are, because we have to First of all, be be sure that the that the um, problem we're addressing is is clearly understood and is even a, a, a true um, problem. Is it true that we are having judges overstaying uh, their mental ability? For example, I, I I would argue that's less of an issue now than maybe it was in the Douglas era. But uh, you know we we can look at that. Um, and, but also we want to make sure that we are then uh, not in the process losing the benefits of uh, of the current system. When our framers designed the Constitution, they envisioned this system of life tenure judges um, chiefly as an insurance of judicial independence, independence both from the other branches of government, so they're not going to be influenced by the legislative or executive branches, and also for judges who might be following the lead of demagogues and want 
um, you know, trying to trying to change the laws from the bench effectively to suit passing trends rather than uh, looking at what the law actually how the laws were actually written. Um, so they assumed that if you really needed to remove a judge for misconduct, you could do it through the impeachment process and that judges wouldn't remain on the bench past their ability to fully fulfill the duties of their, off their office. Historically, there have been different phases where that has maybe been true or not true. Early In the early years, people often rejected Supreme Court uh, seats even because, or, or retired early because of the just physical difficulties of the office of writing circuit. Um, today, we don't have to do that. We have a much easier system. We have clerks to help us. We have uh, the... Um, the uh, technology developed to help us. It may be an easier job today than it ever has been uh, historically. Uh, but there are, I think, real concerns that um, that perhaps the, the life tenure system hasn't done as much as the founders hoped to ensure this judicial independence. Certainly our judges don't have to be concerned about their next job down the line. Very rarely do you see a judge um, retiring mid-career and then making a shift. Um, normally they they figure they're, they're there for life. And so they're not looking for their next job, but uh, there are concerns that things like it has been written about the greenhouse effect with, of Linda Greenhouse at the New York Times, the effect of the, um, the approval of the broader society, the media, um, legal academia may in fact affect how a judge rules. So, uh, so one uh, point I might make is that it, perhaps there are reasons to believe that our, our judicial uh, life tenure system isn't doing everything it could in terms of um, in terms of protecting against uh, problems with judicial independence as long as judges are still looking for validation uh, to, to anything outside their own ability to interpret the law uh, faithfully. Um, so when we, concerns about youthful appointments, I think we have to be uh, aware that having an 18 year term or having, it, some people have proposed limits, a, 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 a age limit as many states have on their judges, that may not actually address all of those uh, those concerns, especially particularly with um, mandatory retirement agencies. It doesn't address the concern of of, uh, of appointing young justices. I, from my perspective, at least on the uh, on the conservative uh, judicial vetting side, I think the best uh, insurance against appointing people too young is the countervailing concern about vetting a judge thoroughly enough that we understand his or her judicial philosophy. So in some sense, the system is its own check because uh, if a president is very concerned about having a, uh, a, a justice who has a, a clear judicial philosophy, a, a, a textualist and originalist approach, for example, to the Constitution, you can't take someone who's in their 30s because they simply don't have the, the record uh, there in the same way that someone in their 40s. So I think you might see the system naturally converging on a uh, an age uh, that you would uh, a, a minimum age beyond which you would not uh, go. Um, in terms of uh, the the political the, the idea of political timing of uh, of uh, retirement, um, I think one one question to ask is it, again I'm, I'm I'm sort of not taking a full position on this, but. What is the what is the um, problem in our in our uh, system if there is a politically motivated retirement? We we certainly know that happens at all the other levels of government. Um, I think the biggest concern from in terms of the function of the system is if people are delaying their retirement. If someone is retiring early because they want to get, throw the seat to um, uh, you know a, a president of a like mind. Um, we may we may find that distasteful, but I but I don't think we have the same level of concern that there's a problem with the with the carrying out of justice um, that you would if you have a situation where someone is overstaying their mental capacity to carry on the job. Um, so it, one of the ways that that has been addressed historically uh, was with the uh, the creation of better um, and more robust. Uh, abilities of judges to take senior status and to have uh, good pension plans. Um, but I, but I definitely can see that that might, that is not, cannot address that issue uh, completely. I'll point out that even with, uh, and, and, and I'm completely open to 18 year term limits. I think that, that, that could create some regularity in the system, but even with that system, there still is the, there still is an opening for politically timed retirements where you could have a, a judge say, you know, I don't want to, I want to stay 14 years and almost all the full 18 years I'm getting older or I'm, my health is, is declined, but they might choose to do so in a timing. Uh, they might choose to retire in a, in a position where 
a president would be able to, of their like mind, would be able to fill out the remainder of the term. I don't think that's something that we need to be com particularly concerned about, um, especially again, as if they're if it requires that they are um, if they're they're retiring early rather than late. My biggest concern would be that it, the, how any of these systems is implemented. The idea of implementing a system in a way that has a clear partisan effect on the court, I think would be a problem. And that's one of the reasons I'm concerned about the idea of court packing proposals in particular. Life tenure, I think if we had a, a constitutional amendment to do that, um, my assumption is that would be something that you would want to have come into effect far enough out that neither party could game out who wins and who loses politically, because if this is something that's truly for the structural benefit of the court as a whole, we want to make sure um, that it's it's not being used for political ends. Uh, but I think the, the challenge with court packing is this is something that is fairly blatantly uh, political, it would clearly have a, an advantage to one party over the other. Historically, just to uh, as, as a counter to some of uh, Professor Weil's comments, I, I think historically the pattern we actually see is if the president in the White House or the, pre the president and the Senate are controlled by the same party, you do in, in election year vacancies, you overwhelmingly see that nominee confirmed. If they're controlled by different parties, you overwhelmingly see those nominees not confirmed. That should be no surprise. That is a natural result of the political process that we have where there's two political elected entities who are making this process. I think that's that's a feature, not a bug. That's, that shows the system is, is responding to electoral realities. Um, even if some of us might not be happy with how that plays out in one particular nomination or the other, but I would be I'd be cautious about uh, packing the court uh, from one party because I think it would simply resort result in uh, in a ratchet effect of one way ratchet where each party would then continue uh, packing the court and it, that would do nothing but further politicize the process. The best way to unpoliticize it would be to get the judges away from making political decisions themselves and as as, as uh, tied as possible to the actual text of the Constitution. And I'll hand it over to uh, Nick. Uh, Noah, go ahead. Thanks, Celia. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, and I've really uh, benefited a lot from listening to the other panelists. I just want to address um, three issues, all of which have been touched on. Um, first, the question of term limits. Second, uh, what I would call the incredible shrinking Supreme Court. Uh, possibility thereof, and third, the court packing question. So let, let me start with the term limits question. I think it's important to clarify, and I think Carrie alluded to this, what problem we would be solving with a constitutional amendment for term limits. To me, the improvement would be meaningful, but mild. And what it would improve is actually something we haven't mentioned, which is the moral repugnance of a world in which people who care about the Supreme Court have to spend our time worrying about the physical well-being uh, or lack thereof of our justices. Uh, there is really something, um, I, I think it's not too strong a term to call it morally improper about a world in which people who care about the constitution, regardless of what political view they might have of it, um, and who care about the Supreme Court as an institution, spend a non-trivial amount of our time speculating about the, uh, the physical well-being frailty um, physiologically and potentially intellectually of justices and in which the justices themselves also are tempted into remaining in office in some instances longer than they ought to. Um, again, possibly for reasons of physical infirmity other, in other cases uh, by reasons of, uh, of their, their mental deterioration under circumstances where um, they really ought not to do it. That, that's unfortunate. And I think a term limit model would do a lot to help us solve this. There would still have to be some tweaking. What it would not solve would be the politicization problem. That would not go away. And as was just, just mentioned, justices could still selectively retire in order to facilitate selection uh, of uh, a new justice by a president um, of, of their preferred party. So, you know, I don't think we would have a perfect solution to that problem uh, in this model either. But that said, I think the term limits plan is, a, is for the reasons I mentioned, a, a desirable one, provided the constitutional amendment can be uh, gotten. Whether it can be gotten is a separate issue. I'm skeptical, but I, I'm not, uh, but I'm not, would not be opposed to it. Second, and this is something we haven't spoken about directly enough, and it's what I call the incredible shrinking Supreme Court. It is possible now that we are entering a moment where 
we cannot appoint, neither party could appoint a Supreme Court nominee and get that person confirmed absent the Senate being controlled by the same party as the president. We don't know this empirically for sure, um, but the realities of the of Judge Merrick Garland's nomination and there not being a vote followed by uh, Justice uh, Barrett's confirmation strongly suggest that there is a real possibility that we're entering into a new era in the history of Supreme Court confirmations. Um, I find it difficult to imagine that if um, uh, the Republicans control the Senate uh, in the next Senate, that uh, Joe Biden would be permitted to get any nominee uh, through whom he would be willing to nominate. And I also think um, that it would go the other way. You know, if Donald Trump had been reelected president and if the Democrats had controlled the Senate, I don't believe that the Democrats in the Senate would have allowed any nominee that President Trump would have been prepared to nominate to be confirmed. So uh, to be clear, I'm not, I, I want to avoid the game of whose fault this is and just try to identify their realities uh, that I think we may already have entered. We don't know it for sure, uh, but we may already have entered it. In that scenario, we could actually have a world where the Supreme Court gets substantially smaller when there is a longish period of time where justices retire or die and where the president and the Senate are not from the same political party. There's nothing in the constitution that prohibits this. I suppose the constitution requires there to be at least one justice of the Supreme Court. There's a quirky question of how many justices must there be under the constitution. We all know the constitution doesn't say how many. It does mention, however, uh, a court and a chief justice. So presumably there has to at least be a chief justice. But you know, potentially you could have a Supreme Court that was down to one member. Um, what would happen if you had zero members of the Supreme Court? Uh, I don't really know. You know, I mean, there would be no justices there to rule that more justices had to be appointed. Um, so you know, I, I'm joking about, about that, but I'm not really joking. I think it may really herald uh, an inf significant inflection point, one that would be really different than the historical moments when the size of the court has gone up or down. Um, in what may Professor Weil characterizes as packing, others might characterize it other ways. But this is a very different, it's a very different sort of a thing. And it creates a kind of winner take all structure where the moment the president and the Senate do come from the same party, uh, there will be lots of appointments to fill at least all of the remaining slots. And potentially, I'll come to this in just a moment, potentially more slots than that through the phenomenon of, of court packing. So I hope that we'll at least touch on this on this situation. I will just say for the record, I don't think this is a good development. Um, for all of the pathologies of our existing system, the depth of polarization that we've reached um, is to my mind disastrous for the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. It has lots of other big political aspects of our polarization that I also think are bad. But um, with respect to the Supreme Court, this polarization to my mind deeply undercuts the legitimacy of the court the reason being that it sends a consistent message to the public that um, all justices are ideologues, that all justices are tools of uh, partisanship. And that kind of um, delegitimization is bad no matter what jurisprudential theory you have. It's bad if you have a Federalist Society jurisprudential theory and believe that justices ought to um, stick closely to the original intent of the of the of the Constitution or and or the text of the statute um, and or judicial restraint. I know that those three things don't always fit together these days. Um, but it's also bad if you have a view that the Constitution is a living document rather than a dead one and that um, the justices have the the constitutional duty to interpret the Constitution as Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. believed in such a way as to keep the organism of our Republic alive. Um, if you believe that uh, you also think that it's bad for the court to be legitimated, delegitimated. Okay, let me turn to court packing now. And in a way, it's an outgrowth. The probabilities of court packing are in part, in part, an outgrowth of this incredible shrinking Supreme Court structure. I, I, I love Professor Weil's paper. I have only one substantive criticism of it, which is that there is a genuine question of whether there can be a quote unquote constitutional convention if no one has ever identified, noted, or found that convention before. So, um, there may be a set of practices which we could then characterize as a convention. That's not quite the same thing as it being a convention. That said, court packing de facto functions as a constraint on a court 
when there might be a president and Senate of the other party. And that court might be tempted to reach conclusions uh, in cases that would be so unpopular that they would force the other party into court packing, right? Joe Biden, we all know, doesn't want to pack the court. He's effectively said so on multiple occasions, but the Democratic base could force him into it under certain circumstances. That's a de facto reality. Actual court packing would have devastating effects on the legitimacy of the court in the long run because it would create a rotating game in which both parties would have the uh, tendency to want to do it. Last thought on this, Ilya, and then I'll be quiet, um, is that the effect um, might or might not be asymmetric, depending on, this goes to Carrie's last point, depending on whether we assessed that one political party was more likely than the other to have both the presidency and both houses of Congress. If we thought that over time, one party was much more likely to have that, then court packing might not be uh, asymmetric, might not be symmetrical, might be asymmetrical. If we thought, however, that the parties are equally likely to have that control, um, as has been true in recent years, then the threat would be symmetrical. Either way, it would be devastating to the effect and legitimacy of the court. And in my mind, that would actually be bad, again, no matter what one's jurisprudence is. Thanks very much for that, Noah, and uh, the preceding three panelists uh, as well. I'm going to give uh, the earlier panelists an opportunity to respond to what they've heard. Uh, before throwing it open to questions, I'll just let attendees know that you can press the raise hand button uh, in your Zoom, and I, I can call on you orally, or you can type your question into chat, and I will then try to weave those questions uh, into our uh, discussion. One before I'm, I'm going to move to Rivka next to respond because she went first, so you can respond to what uh, the others said. But one correction of what Noah said: there is no federal. Ilya, we can't hear you. You've frozen. The, the only drawback is that if he's frozen, he may not be able to hear us either. If, if what Ilya was going to say is that there is no official Federalist Society commitment uh, to uh, textualism, originalism, and judicial restraint, I do, I do agree with that. Um, I recognize that, uh, that the only Federalist commitment is to, um, uh, to interpreting the law according to uh, what, what it, uh, as it is written rather than, uh, than what it ought to be. I think to, to paraphrase the, uh, it is emphatically the province of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what it should be. I think that is, uh, Part of the official uh, the official credo of the of the Federalists. So thank you, Ilya. I, I, I should say that uh, one of the things I I did uh, many years ago was I actually surveyed um, uh, Federalist students attending a, a couple of events, uh, Federalist uh, speakers, um, and and then um, um, uh, members of the board and founders of Federal Society on liberal conservative issues, and found that. Um, that uh, the the board was um, was uh, was basically uh, slightly uh, conservative on a liberal conservative scale, uh, while um, the the uh, liberal commentators uh, came out as being quite liberal, and that's just because uh, I think partly uh, in both cases because they're elites, and so some of the uh, some of the um, issues on which conservatives. Um, uh, conservative elites don't share uh, share as many issues with rank and file, but it, it, it act actually was quite a wide range of views. Some were in favor of affirmative action, some were not. Some were in favor of abortion, some were not. We're talking about Federalist Society founders, uh, there really was uh, there really was quite a range. Okay, uh, uh, I was, sorry, I was kicked off briefly, but uh, I was about to turn it over to Rivk to respond to. Uh, what she had previously heard. Okay, so this was very interesting. Uh, I will start uh, with responding to comments uh, about my thesis. So um, I read the history differently. Uh, if we look at the first crisis of transition of power from federalist to anti-federalist, uh, we see that on the one hand, there was no problem with the appointment of Chief Justice Marshall. Uh, it was by a voice vote. It was agreed, it was, bipart it was with bipartisan consent. And on the other hand, we, uh, the words of Jefferson still echoes that uh, the Federalists are trying to put their people into the judicial branch and retire into the judicial branch. And that was unacceptable 
So you see already in the first crisis that there is a distinguishing a, 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 a criteria. Do we agree with the appointment or we do not agree with the appointment? When you look even at the appointments of Washington, you see a very a, a different a behavior. If it had bipartisan consent, it went to voice vote. At the same time, the first president sometimes needed to go to a roll call because there wasn't consent and you needed to garner a bipartisan consent and to show it. So I, I see it from the very beginning uh, of the Republic. Or if you look at the great crisis over the appointment of Peter Daniel in 1841. So uh, 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 the frustration was so big that, uh, uh, that uh, the, uh, those against actually boycotted the event in, 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 in in protest, just like the Democrats just did uh, in the Judiciary Committee with regard to the appointment of Barrett, uh, actually protesting, boycotting the fact that you do it at lambda time. By the way, American history is such that usually court packing and midnight appointments go together in tandem. They belong to the same toolkit. Uh, the same presidents that engage in uh, midnight actions also engage in some kind of, uh, of changing the size of the court. So I, I read the history differently. Um, with regard to the divided uh, government situation, um, um, actually the, the record is a little bit more complicated. When you look at the four votes that were held, roll call votes, uh, in divided, gov divided government behave differently in the sense that you don't have a voice vote. You do have only a roll call. Uh, people wanted to see the names of the people voting. But at the same time, in three out of four cases, which is a very uh, substantial number, uh, uh, there was a confirmation. Now, uh, uh, in, the, in the cases that there was no vote at all, uh, uh, the same applied whether it was united or divided, and it had to do with nominations that occurred after June or mid-June of a presidential election year. So I don't see a difference in terms of a divided government or united government when we are talking about Supreme Court appointments. And, and just to remind you, Kennedy uh, was appointed, Justice Kennedy was appointed during Reagan's time uh, 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 when the control over uh, the Senate was in the hands of the Democrats and he was uni voted unanimously just re most recently. Um, so uh, uh, again, uh, this is not the issue. Um, um, I, Regarding uh, other issues that came uh, that came up, um, <laughs> the fact that uh, we are concerned about maybe shrinking the uh, uh, shrinking Supreme Court that suggests that we cannot ignore the fact that there is a, a major legitimacy crisis over the U.S. Supreme Court. We cannot not identify what are the causes uh, for the legitimacy crisis, and I, I suggest that the crisis. Um, uh, is as a result of the fact that there was an abuse of the appointment power and uh, we, people should get together on a bipartisan uh, level and offer a solution. So maybe the court packing should not totally address the mischief, but partly uh, address the mischief, but in a way that is acceptable to both sides. Uh, but we should at least identify what went wrong. Why, why are we uh, facing the situation we are currently uh, facing? Uh, so I will start with that. Okay, so um, I disagree and uh, part of it's empirical and unfortunately because we don't have slides, I can't show you uh, the slides here. But I, I wanna say one thing, uh, I wasn't sure whether I caught it right what Noah was saying about something um, that there would still be strategic retirement uh, and he may not have said that. I just wanna be clear. If, if someone um, has an 18 year term limit, uh, as, as a justice is within an 18 years, decides that they wanna uh, retire, the president can only fill the re rest of that slot. So there's no advantage um, uh, to re early retirement to, uh, to uh, uh, select. Um, an another issue is um, uh, Steve Calabrese has actually proposed that, um, uh, that you require that the slots be filled. This would require a constitutional amendment, obviously, but basically what it would say is that if you haven't filled slots um, after a certain number of months, um, you don't get paid. And then after another period of time, there's no other business that can be in order in the Senate um, if you don't, um, uh, if you don't, uh, uh, if, if, if you haven't filled the slot. That would solve the problem. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. 
Um, but on the empirical issue, um, I, part of the problem is that people talking about election year are not distinguishing between the January appointments and uh, the later appointments. The January appointments are treated somewhat differently, but Feb February to October uh, of election year, when you have a hostile or opposing party Senate, there have been seven instances, including Garland, six of them were unsuccessful and all six of them did not get an up or down vote. So Garland was treated the same as people generally are in that situation, no different. There's no up or down vote in most. The, then for the same party Senate, people have, uh, nominated be, between February and October, eight of the 10 times that nomination has been successful. Uh, and then inauguration used to be after, used to be on March 4th. There's a number of, uh, of appointments that are done after the election um, uh, uh, and until inauguration. It hasn't been done this century or even last century, um, but seven out of eight of those when you had the same party were put through. So I guess what I would say is that I think the Senate should have voted on Garland. I think they should have done their job and filled the slot, but they treated them just the same as they treated mostly everyone else in the situation. As for uh, Barrett, uh, the only real big difference in the Senate treatment, at least, was that she was voted before the election. There's never been a, a person voted to the court that quick, that close to the election. But the typical thing would be to, to be voted after the election. Um, and, and that would have been, and that seems to me to be more outrageous than making the uh, decision and subjecting it. Okay, we're going to turn to audience questions now. Uh, I will just note one thing, uh, 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 Rivka, uh, you, you mentioned the uh, bipartisan consensus in presidential election years. Uh, I mean, the, uh, I, I, you know, your, your paper stands for what it stands for, but uh, I'll just note that uh, uh, in presidential election years to vacancies arising during those years, so Kennedy doesn't count because that was the Bork, Bork vacancy that arose the year before, uh, but arising presidential election years, when it's united government, we have 18 of 20 were confirmed and divided two of 10. Now, the last time we had divided before Garland when there was a confirmation was 1888. It just doesn't uh, happen that much, but um, I, I'm not sure how much of a bipartisan consensus there is uh, uh, in presidential election years uh, or more broadly. But let's go to let's go to audience questions. Uh, Ilya Soman. I see Ilya Soman there. OK, can you hear me? Uh, I think my question will actually enable Rivka to answer the other Ilya as well, if she so wishes. Um, so uh, I have. Uh, a quick question for Rivka and if possible, a quick question for Jim. The quick question for Rivka is simply, let's assume that your historical analysis of the norm is correct. Still, how would you avoid this issue of the spiral that others have raised that if the Democrats act as you suggest when they get the chance for Republicans responding kind, maybe the answer is the Republicans will read your article and agree with it and say, yes, she's right. We, we're just getting what we deserve, but I suspect the Republicans won't feel that way, not because of a pro any problem with your article necessarily, because that's just the, the way partisan politics is. My question for the group about term limits is, what about the possibility as a lot of scientists think life expectancy will continue to increase, people might be able to serve on the, might be able to routinely live to 100 or 110 or even longer, and therefore a justice who was appointed at the age of 50 might serve for 50 or 60 years. Uh, I wonder if that possibility strengthens the case for some sort of term limits in that, uh, you know, we might have justices appointed 50, 60 years ago still on the court. Uh, so those are the, the two things. And perhaps if the other really agrees, we can go to Rivka first so she can, she can answer my point, but also answer his point if, if that's what she wants to do. Yes, okay. Rivka, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ilya, first of all, uh, Ilya Soman, it's great uh, to hear you and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, uh, I want to uh, address first uh, the numbers. So I've looked at 42 uh, nominations since the beginning of the Republic. Every nomination that occurred within the calendar year of the presidential election or or the appointment was done within 12 months of the president taking office. Now, in the case of Kennedy, the appointment was done within 12 months 
of the president taking office. It was done in uh, February. And the reason why I'm looking both at the nomination and the appointment is that you, in order to have an appointment, uh, you need the final act. So we need to look at the both of them together. Uh, so I try to give a, a definition that is expansive, yet, you know, that, uh, that is not too broad. And that's what Kennedy definitely is within the uh, uh, game. Now, uh, my numbers are different. That's why I would be happy, Jim, to see later your numbers. But my numbers, as far as the 42 nominations that do not include Barrett goes, uh, uh, the only people who did not get who did not get a vote, up and down vote, were people nominated on June 15 or later uh, within the presidential election year and before elections. Now I agree with you that after elections is a different game than before election, but only in the sense that uh, uh, we have more, uh, the picture is clearer. Nonetheless, also after election, you need bipartisan consent. And if you don't have bipartisan consent, you wait for the uh, uh, incoming Senate. Now, I, bipartisan consent, from my perspective, is that you have at least some senators from the op opposite party that agrees to the confirmation. Now, uh, in terms of the spira, the question of Ilya, a, a, the tit for tat, how doesn't it get out of control? So first of all, the, the proposal is very different than other proposals so far in the sense that it is principled, in the, in the sense that it doesn't try to, to change an ideology. I would argue the same thing if the Democrats would have done the, uh, behaved the same way in the last four years. And I think that everyone, regardless of the uh, partisan position, should agree that we need some kind uh, to bring back a uh, bipartisanship to the process of appointment. Now, what happens in the years before the last year uh, uh, of the presidential election year is that uh, you don't transfer the appointment power but if you behave the way that the republicans behaved in the last year with regard to mary garland you you uh, uh, you actually transfer the appointment power to the next president this is what's so problematic you now I, I don't think it I, I don't think it should get out of hand because i'm not trying to affect ideology of the court and I'm hopeful that maybe there can be some kind of a bipartisan agreement in the sense that how many justices do we add? Do we fully counter the, the, the mischief or do we partially uh, 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 counter the mischief? And then from then on establish again bipartisan norms. This is something you can play with. So I'll stop here. Great. Very, uh, very, very, very briefly. Um, so just to, the, uh, so, ones where there was an opposing um, uh, opposing Senate, Walworth twice, King once, uh, Spencer uh, once, Bradford once, and um, uh, in the, uh, and then um, Thornbury and Fortis uh, were all um, not after June and did not have a uh, and did not have a, uh, a vote up or down. Okay, my numbers are different, but continue afterwards. <laughs> okay, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll try to post uh, uh, relevant materials on the website for this event uh, afterwards. And for that matter, my statistical uh, uh, appendix to my book, uh, again, supremedisorder.com, we'll try to put that there, which doesn't have any interpretive analysis in that, but you can just go through every, every nomination, the dates, and you know, whether the Senate's controlled by the opposite party and, and all of that. Uh, okay, let's go to a question from the president of the Federal Society, uh, Gene Meyer. Uh, Gene, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I, I wanted to ask. Uh, by the way, I would say on the part on the partisanship. You know, we didn't these have impeachment or warrant signs all over the place. So I mean, there, there's definitely been partisanship before uh, directed at the court. Uh, you know, for, at a fairly high level. Um, I, I wanted to first of all, uh, I wanted to ask Professor Feldman a question. Also, I would point out he has a he has quite an interesting podcast. One part of it, he did a whole series of things uh, of podcasts on the Federal Society, which you know I agreed with a lot of some things. I might have questions about, but I thought it was very well done and, and appreciated that. Um, I I but I wanted to take issue with the question of of uh, de, of um, well, nobody's going to be confirmed in the in the in the in Supreme Court nominees going to be confirmed in the Biden administration, and obviously time will tell on that, but. It seems to me that all of this on both parties is should head toward some degree of compromise. Uh, I, I agree on the one hand, you know, president's got to appoint somebody he's willing to appoint and wants to appoint, but presidents can be and 
greatly affected by, look, I don't have a majority of the Senate. I can't get maybe the person I'd most like, but I can get somebody who I'd be pretty satisfied with. I'll talk with the leaders of the uh, other party and we'll work something out. And that's how a lot of this has worked in the past. And I don't see, I think it's an illusion to think that just because we've had such hyper-partisanship recently, that that's not good. there's not gonna be a lot of pressure to do exactly that and avoid a situation where you have eight or seven or six justices on the court. Um, Gene, thanks for the kind words about the, the podcast. Um, I really appreciate it. I would actually love to hear offline uh, some of your questions or criticisms, I'm very open to that. Um, my response to your question is, as my uh, beloved grandmother of blessed memory uh, used to say, from your mouth to God's ear, you know, I would, <laughs> I would love it if it would turn out to be that way. Um, I would just say, I think that Merrick Garland was probably the most moderate justice that Barack Obama uh, would have been prepared to nominate. Um, someone who, uh, and nobody really publicly attacked him as being too progressive or too liberal or having the wrong kind of jurisprudence. Um, and I would just to say, again, and let's imagine that she was on the other foot, imagine that the Republicans had won the presidency and, and Donald Trump was still gonna be president and that um, the Democrats had won the Senate. I, I think I can say with a fair degree of confidence that the Democrats would not have approved any Donald Trump nominee. Um, pretty much no matter who it, no matter who it was. So, you know, I, I very much hope that turns out to be true. I also agree that it wouldn't have to be a permanent equilibrium. Um, it could just be temporary. And you might imagine, you know, rash, and I think you're also right from a game theoretic perspective, rationally, a president who really wants someone at some point might be able to, to find common ground with senators who also really want somebody, but under highly polarized political conditions, their calculus is shift. And a president who's worried that, you know, he will be perceived as too soft by his own base and senators who think that they would frustrate their own base. Um, you have a, have a very much reduced interest in getting nominations through. And that's going to be especially true at a moment when the court has a strong majority of conservatives, as indeed it, it does now. So or it would, it would also be true reciprocally if there were a strong majority of liberals, which hasn't been the case since the since the Warren court. So I hope you're right, but I, I, I worry that, that it may not be that way. Great, uh, Carrie had a, a follow-up on this. Yeah, maybe just another uh, reasons beyond just your grandmother's prayers that, that it might be right. I, I think in, in several situations, we've seen that the political check, I think actually can function on, on these things. That is effectively the check that our constitution leaves us on, on, on a lot of these issues. I think the political check even functioned in the case of the Garland nomination. When, when uh, McConnell said, we're not gonna have a vote on him, there was a political opportunity. If the American people felt like that was above, beyond the pale, that was just not, we can't go there, you would have seen a very different result in 2016. Um, and uh, and so I, I think that is the political check functioning. I think if you had had a, a Senate that said, you know what, we're just not going to confirm any nominee of this president we're opposed to, you might see the American people saying, you know what, that's that's too far. I think you probably would at a certain point. So the court, you could, I could imagine some degree of, you know, your, your shrinking court hypothesis, but I, I believe that once you got, you, you would never get to zero. At a certain point, the American people are going to say, you know what, this is this is too much. This is beyond the pale. I think we, we see this already. Um, you saw that in the contrast between the Kavanaugh confirmation and the Barrett confirmation. In some ways, a lot of people were saying this should be more intense, right? I expected this would be replacing Ginsburg with a Trump nominee would be even more intense confirmation process. What we saw for a lot of different reasons, but I think in part because of the, the proximity of the election and the American people watching was a less intense confirmation process, despite the fact that it was a dramatic change and shift of, of, of on the court, and that it was done in a relatively short period of time, because the Democrats perceived that the, the, the Kavanaugh nomination, the intensity with, with, with which that was prosecuted, went very badly for them. So to the extent that the American people say, we don't want politicization, and, and maybe we can all agree the American people are com comfortable with a lot more politicization than we might want to see, perhaps. But I think you would see that. I think we're seeing the same thing on court packing right now. The idea of court packing was very is, is certainly very popular among the extreme branches of the Democratic Party. But after the election, it was forecasted to be a blue wave. And then many um, Democrat, moderate Democrats felt like that that some of the extreme policies like court packing didn't play well for them in the election. I think that more than anything else is the reason, obviously, if they're unable to do it because they don't control the Senate, that's the number one reason you won't have court packing. But if 
if um, our politicians view that court packing itself is going to be viewed as more extreme by the American people, that's what's going to be the check on it. So I think I think the, the, the American people's view of all of these prospects is what's going to form an additional check that maybe will not let it all run down as dramatically as, as uh, we might fear. All right, let's go to a question from Will Stark. Go ahead, Will. Thank you. Um, I haven't heard a lot about the anti-democratic uh, uh, Senate. Essentially, uh, consent to the govern, yada, yada. Uh, we live in a democratic republic and we have to remain tethered both to the democratic and the republic part. And it seems we've come unmoored from the democratic part. You know, coastal elites. Will? I guess we've lost Will, in but I'll. In the Northeastern oh. states. Um, meanwhile, you've got senators from Wyoming and Idaho and these extractive states, low population, or the southern states, Mississippi, Alabama, that spent most of the 20th century rebelling against civil rights, um, controlling who sits on the Supreme Court. And it seems that degree of anti democratic. Uh, control is bound to break at some point. And I think I've found universal assessment by the panel that court packing would necessarily be a bad thing, but wouldn't it just be a return, a rebalancing of the democratic versus the republic? Great. Thanks, Will. And I, I think Rivka is actually for expanding the court and, and court packing. In fact, our article is called Court Packing as an Antidote. But does anyone want to address this uh, small state uh, issue and uh, senatorial representation uh, as it relates to the legitimacy of uh, Supreme Court structure. Uh, Elia, I want to weigh in on something else if I can. Sure. Um, I want to, to clarify what's wrong with the Merrick Garland uh, situation. I would have no problem if the, I, 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 the problem with the behavior of uh, um, the Senate with regard to Mary Garland is the following one, that there was no vote. So there was no accountability. Now, um, if the vote was a rejection, it would have been a different conversation. So I'm not saying that uh, uh, there were no rejections in a, a, a presidential election year. There were rejections. So the problem is the fact that it was not even uh, on the floor for a vote. And uh, we don't really know, there was a reason why it wasn't brought to the floor. We don't really know how the senators would have voted on the merits of Mary Garland. And there was a reason why Mitch McConnell did not want to bring it to a vote. And that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying there was no rejection. And the names uh, that we have heard that there were no votes actually before uh, mid-June, I have actually numbers for them in my charts, in my article. We'll, we'll, we'll post that as well. Uh, uh, Noah, you had a, a brief uh, response to that as well. Just, just in response to Will's point, and always appropriate at, at a Federal Society event to mention Madison's view. Um, you know, Madison was strongly opposed to the small state equal representation in the Senate. And he left the 1787 Philadelphia Convention at which he had gotten much of what he wanted. I mean, he was after all the principal draftsman of the constitution. He left depressed over this issue. Um, it was forced on him by the small state walkout. And although now we may see that as a, a crucial feature of our constitutional structure, um, Madison's objection to it was that it was undemocratic. Now he was from a big state, so it's maybe not so surprising that he felt that way, but that is what, what he thought. Um, in contrast, I think um, the Supreme Court when created at the founding was not clearly understood to be an institution that would have the kind of power that it eventually assumed through the overturning of federal legislation. And so, you know, this is a complex issue, but it was certainly not, I think everyone who studies the issue from an originalist perspective would agree that it wasn't certain that the court would grow to the power that it did eventually uh, grow to. And some would think it was actually counterindicated by, by the framers. So there's, there's sort of a difference there. And I, you know, to my mind, this shows you that the constitution as it has evolved has different features than it had uh, at a structural level from the way it looked uh, right at the moment of drafting or the moment of ratification. To me, that's okay. Uh, to others, that may be a, a problem. 
Right. And of course, uh, the small state issue isn't just about uh, so-called uh, red states. For every Wyoming, there's a Rhode Island. For every you know Mississippi, there's a Hawaii, et, et cetera. Um, or a Delaware. If you or a Delaware. It. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, anyway, our, our panelists are not angels, so we can't get to all of your questions or answer them perfectly. But nevertheless, uh, we will now move on to uh, Katie Exum. And please be concise go. with your question as we as we uh, run uh, towards the end of our program. Yes, I will. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Great. Um, I just have a quick question. I noticed a few days ago that dictionary.com changed the definition of court packing. And I wanted to follow up with that because during the vice presidential debate, you heard them refer to court packing as the nominations of the um, federal judges, not necessarily the Supreme Court justice level. And I wanted some clarification because general population of Americans may not really understand court packing. And when it's referred to as filling open seat judges, not necessarily Supreme Court level, but the federal judiciary system, I think that that's a little concerning for me, especially. Um, I live in the state of Alabama, so that's very concerning for our general population because they didn't understand that. All right. Who want, Thanks, Katie. Who wants to take just the, the basic definitions, which we should have started with, of what is court packing? Anyone? I'll go to Carrie. I'm, I'm happy to jump in there. Uh, yeah, I think it, obviously deciding what we're talking about. I think, I think most of the people on this panel are talking about the same thing, but when you talk about it publicly, they're, they're, it's been moved around. Historically, when we talk about court packing, we're talking about things like Delano, Frank Delano Roosevelt uh, was most famous for, which is changing the size of the court uh, to add seats to the court. Um, it, it was It's something that is certainly within the statutory authority of president and Congress to do. It's not constitutionally de defined as a certain number. We've had varying numbers of justices over the history of America, but the idea that he was doing it in the in with the goal of adding like-minded members to the court, outweighing a court that was opposed to him and his political agenda. That's what earned it the term court packing. At the time when he was trying to do it, it was very unpopular, even with his own democratically controlled Senate. And so the question then is, is that something we should employ today? Others have tried to kind of use it a more broad term and saying, well, filling seats in an aggressive way or in a way that they don't like qualifies as court packing. We can debate the merits of whether those are, whether we want to fill those seats, whether we wanted to fill, you know, the, the uh, Scalia vacancy, whether Garland should have filled it, whether Gar Gorsuch should have filled it. But I think that's a different issue than the court, than packing the courts in this, in the, in the FDR sense. Um, so just to create that, to clarify that distinction. Great. And uh, Jim wanted uh, a short uh, sir reply on this as well. I, well, actually, I just wanted to, to suggest the data shows um, uh, the Gallup polling uh, that was done shows that the court packing was popular with the general public um, and only became unpopular after it was uh, defeated. I mean, he was extremely popular at the time. And if it hadn't been such a, a, such a uh, uh, despicable abuse of, uh, of, of political power, um, uh, he, uh, the, the uh, Democratic Senate wouldn't have uh, opposed, and also American Bar Association opposed. Okay, I hadn't come across that because, of course, after Roosevelt had been uh, in a landslide reelected in 1936, this was when he won all but two states, the as goes Maine, so goes Vermont election. Two years later at the midterms, the Democrats lost uh, 80 seats in the House and eight in the Senate, which is attributed to the, uh, the failed uh, court packing. Uh, how do you read that, Jim? Um, I, uh, the research was done by Greg, I can't think of his name, a, a major political scientist at yeah, uh, uh, Ohio State, and um, he shows that it was only popular ap unpopular after it was mm -hmm. defeated. And the Gallup polls in that era were really quite good. You know, they were getting over a 90% response rate. Even though they were doing quota sampling, they, they still have pretty high quality. That, that's because they weren't doing polling over the internet uh, and people were responding mm -hmm. on their smartphones, right? Well, people, anyway. yeah, people, yeah. Uh, okay, let's move to our next question uh, from uh, Tom Palmer. I, I'm sorry, I remembered his name, Greg Calvera. All right, all right. We, we can try to put that in the, in the meeting notes as well if you send that paper to us. All right, Tom Palmer. Yeah, I just wondered if you turn the chat on so we could send a comment or question by that way. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I thought the chat was uh, was on already for uh, attendees. Yes, uh, you're supposed to be able to submit your questions 
via chat. So tech folks, if that is at this stage uh, without you know blowing up all our computers possible, um, uh, we are enabling that now. Thank you, Tom, for that. Uh, let's move then to uh, Gabe Roth, uh, who I believe is uh, Gabe Roth from Fix the Courts. Yes, uh, thanks, Ilya, and thanks all the panelists for uh, for being here. Tov shehishtataft, Professor Weil. Um, she, um, my question is about the Supreme Court Term Limits and Regular Appointments Act. It, was, it is the first time uh, in American history that a bill was introduced that would impose prospective 18-year term limits on future Supreme Court justices. And when we were having this conversation on Capitol Hill, the bill was uh, initially drafted actually uh, back in the summer of 2019 when I was speaking with Republicans and Democrats about the bill. Obviously, constitutionality was a big question that we had whether or not we could impose term limits on future justices via legislation. So I guess my question to you is, if you don't see the bill as constitutional, how would a constitutional, uh, how, how could the, such a bill, if it passed, be challenged in federal court, i.e. who would have standing and how would you see such uh, litigation proceeding? Great, thanks for that. Uh, Jim, I think that's uh, more directly to you. You're muted. I, I actually don't know enough about standing to be able to answer the, the, the question and maybe Noah or someone else uh, would be uh, better on that, that aspect. I did want to address one issue is, uh, that's related to it. Um, there's an assumption this would be hard to get through the states and I think that's wrong. Uh, it's hard to get through Congress, but getting uh, a constitutional amendment, it'd be easy to get through the states. You just uh, give it as an anti-Washington, anti-entrenchment thing and, uh, and it would go through quite quickly. Uh, it's the Congress doesn't want to do it because they want it, they, they're afraid of term limits for Congress. So that's the, that's the real sticking part. Before I go to Noah on the uh, technicalities of how such a lawsuit would work, um, just uh, uh, kind of expanding on the, the Lindgren Calabresi paper, they conclude that it has to be a constitutional amendment because the type of legislation that's being proposed uh, now that Gabe referred to um, would change the, the status of the office to which the judges or justices are confirmed, thereby violating the constitutional provision that they serve uh, during good behavior, making them senior justices is, is not... Uh, not good enough. But uh, Noah, uh, I'll let you speak in a second. And also, what about the possibility of, if it's politically unpalatable in Congress, pairing it with uh, a constitutional amendment to keep the Supreme Court at nine justices? Um, that second one is a, is a more of a political consideration. I just to answer the standing issue briefly, the usual way that um, you challenge the constitutionality of an appointment is if you have business before the uh, person who has been appointed. Um, and I think in principle, there's no reason that couldn't work as well for someone who had litigation in front of a court uh, where um, the litigant asserted that the, that the judge was appointed unconstitutionally or illegitimately. So I think that's probably the easiest way to get standing in a situation like that. There might be other tricks too, but that would be, I think, the least controversial. Okay, um, let's see. We have a question um, in the chat from... Tom Palmer, who previously wanted to use the chat. Okay, fine. Uh, given the history of the court uh, and who historically has pushed court packing, I wondered if any of you could comment on this broad point of view question. If we're trying to keep politics out, shouldn't we acknowledge that progressives are more political than originalists? People have voted for more conservative presidents and they are the ones who ultimately create the court. Who wants to address that kind of political question? Okay, I'll... No, again, there you go. Good. I will just say briefly, it's interesting that you raise this. The question sounds like it's coming from a conservative perspective, but I've actually heard people on the left um, say something similar, namely, um, uh, or analogous at least, namely that um, the Supreme Court on the whole over the last century, since the end of the so-called Lochner era, has been better for progressives than it has been for conservatives. And so delegitimating the Supreme Court through court packing would actually be a bad thing for progressives. Um, you know, I, I think... It's very much in the eye of the beholder of um, which is quote unquote more political. And certainly there is a view that each side is political. That's a, this is itself a contested question. So I don't wanna solve that problem, but I do think that it's interesting that people on both sides of this issue are trying to figure out who would win if there were court packing. You know, Would it be better for progressives or would it be better for conservatives? Right now, given the current configuration of the court 
any talk of court packing would be better for progressives than it would be for conservatives. That's not necessarily always true, though, seen in the longer historical uh, historical view. All right, let's go to, well, Meyer Kovach uh, has raised his hand. And by the way, I should note that those who are calling in, if you press star nine, I will see a raised hand from the phone callers uh, and can call on you that way. But Meyer has both uh, raised his hand and he's typed into the chat. So I will recognize Meyer to the extent that you asked the actual question that you, that you chatted. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone participating and Professor Feldman, I love your book, The Scorpion. So please, uh, the question is based on that. So you can read it from there. Oh, you want me to read it? Okay. If you want. Okay, okay. As we know, some of the most progressive Supreme Court justices, uh, Warren, Stevens, Souter, et cetera, were named, nominated by Republicans. So why can't we just sit tight and let things uh, play out as they are? And uh, relatedly, uh, do you see a way that one or two of the justices, the current justices, could pull a modern day Owen Roberts switch in time to save nine? Now, there's there's some you know dispute about whether Roberts did that uh, out of political pressure or just because he was you know uh, changing his jurisprudence and, and whatnot. But anyway, Noah. Yeah, I, I actually think this is a very insightful point. Uh, th this question. I mean, I, I think um, Justice Gorsuch's votes. Uh, last uh, summer in um, both the Title VII case and in the Creek Nation case um, came as surprises to many court observers, myself included, and suggest the complexity of presuming that we know exactly how a justice will come down on various questions by virtue of the party of appointment. I think lots remains to be seen. Um, and with respect to the second point, you know, I mean, if there were the kind of pressure on the court in the presence of a Democratic House and, and Senate and President, I do think that would probably have some effect on at least some of the current justices. You know, there, there's little point in engaging in a um, game-changing conservative decision if you think that the direct consequence of that will be the packing of the court and the reversal of that decision by a new liberal majority. So, you know, all the justices try to act in good conscience, but they also all have some room for the exercise of prudence in relationship to their conscience. Um, so that's my, that's my answer. Carrie, you wanted to say something on this. Yeah. And notwithstanding Ilya's, I think, correct judgment, it seems that now that we see some of the internal, uh, back and forth in some of these cases, maybe Roberts didn't in fact switch in time in intentionally to save nine. He may have actually voted to switch on those cases before the court packing issue was brought up. But I, I do have a real concern that some of the discussion of court packing, um, is less about actually packing the court, but as it, about in, in influencing the court to do that kind of a switch in time. It's really as a math method of intimidation of the court. If you look, for example, at the amicus brief that Senators Whitehouse and several other of his co of colleagues uh, submitted in the New York rifle and pistol case last year, where they as much as said, if the court doesn't rule the way we want in this case, which in that case was to declare the case moot, uh, we may be forced to take proposals for court reform. I think everyone pretty clearly read that as a veiled reference to uh, packing the court. And people, particularly because of the, the um, perception that Chief Justice Roberts is very sensitive to issues of, of, of uh, the legitimacy of the court, the, the institution of the court, I think have, have targeted him in particular as a someone to make these threats that, as, as we've discussed several times, a lot of people on this call, maybe even everyone agrees that there would be some negative consequences to court packing, whether it's necessary or not um, in, in, in Professor uh, Weil's case, but that it, this could be something that could cause damage to the institution. And yet they're willing to do it effect, effectively as a threat to encourage justices to change their vote. I think that's a, that is a real um, concern to see this being held out as a as an intimidation tactic uh, and and to the extent that justices are changing their votes not because they think there's a legal conclusion that is that is warranted or, or mandated by the language they're interpreting but because they are concerned about other political effects of their decision that that to me would be a clear violation of their oath to uphold the constitution that would be a, a, a abdication of their judicial role and in fact flies in the face of the whole purpose of creating a court that is has life tenure that is independent of the other branches because they, they, our founders were trying to avoid that uh, the ability 
for other branches to intimidate the court. So I think that's something we should be uh, very concerned about uh, seeing that kind of rhetoric. Great, and uh, Rivka, you had something. Yeah, so uh, I'm also, I agree with Kerry that uh, one should not threaten the court in order to reach particular decisions. I think this goes against independence of the judiciary. This is dangerous. Uh, so I would, I would caution against uh, any kind of court packing as an argument in order to influence particular decisions. Uh, at the same time, and in this sense, I'm different again from the proposal of FDR in the 1930s. At the same time, I think that we need to realize that uh, in the way we uh, appoint justices to the Supreme Court is connected to the electoral cycle, is connected to a democratic rationale. And then one has to ask uh, oneself a, a real question. Can you live with the way that appointments were made over the last few years? And what I've suggested is that there is a principal problem with two of the appointments. So in that sense, so anyone who thinks that there is a problem with the current composition as a result of an abuse of the uh, appointed power would want a redress for such an abuse. Now, uh, there was a question in the chat, or how many justices are we talking about? And here I think we can, uh, we can see a compromise because on the one hand, one can think about two justices because of the problem with a, a appointment uh, with uh, Mary Garland not getting a vote and with a um, uh, Barrett being appointed uh, as elections were underway. Uh, now if it's two justices then uh, you don't get a democratic majority and uh, it's still a Republican majority and nonetheless uh, it's a very different composition of the court in terms uh, in in terms that um, uh, Democrats may be able to live with. A more drastic measure would be four justices to the US Supreme Court, because assuming that Mary Garland would have been confirmed if he got the vote, and assuming that Barrett should not have been appointed, then in order to have a democratic majority, you would need four justices. Now, I think that would be a much more a, a, a radical proposal and a, a, a would definitely not garner bipartisan consent, I assume. So if uh, the Democrats and the Republicans can reach some kind of an agreement on a, a enlargement of the court a, a, in a way that restores eventually a bipartisan norms, a, I think that would be important. Well, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders during the primary said that uh, when he asked about court packing, said, well, if we add two and then they'll add two and in 50, I'm not going to do the accent, but he said, in 50 years, we're going to have 87 justices. That's ridiculous. Uh, so, so perhaps the only thing I agree with uh, with Bernie Sanders on, but that would be a, an interesting debate to have uh, between Bernie and and Rivka, I guess. But Jim, uh, we're, we're we had just a few minutes. Jim, you had something on this? No, no. Okay, okay. Uh, well, the last question with the last questioner with his hand up uh, in the uh, in the Zoom is Joshua Freundel. So let's take that question and then we'll wrap up. Hi, um, thank you to all the the speakers. Um, I was just curious and. Maybe this is a good wrap up question. So everyone is, is discussed sort of substantive changes that may help to, to decrease the, the political heat, term limits, issues of court packing. I was wondering if there's anything procedural that might help as well. And so I think the easiest one that, that came to mind for me was uh, raising the threshold for uh, confirming a justice to a supermajority. And if that would help bring it bring it back to center, or if that might lead to, you know, even more of sort of Professor Feldman's court shrinking phenomena. Sure, and I'll I'll uh, uh, add into that. Uh, you know, changing the Senate rules to require certain kinds of procedures or a hearing within a certain number of uh, days after nomination and a vote after a certain number of days. These sorts of questions, or just have counsel questioning rather than senators. I don't know. All of these sorts of process confirmation process uh, reforms. Uh, who would like to speak on that? Noah, go ahead. Just very briefly, that that would uh, hi Jojo. That that would drive, in principle, would drive the court to the center. You know, that kind of a supermajority requirement would mean fewer people who are deeply ideologically committed on either side. So if you like that, then it's good. If you don't like that, that would be bad. Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say I, I would be would be concerned, though, that that you could you would have fewer confirmations. This is why I was happy to get rid of the filibuster, because it puts us back in a situation which is more like historically where most nominees are confirmed as a matter of course, and except for the extreme nominees, you, you don't have people who are not getting confirmed. I'll say one thing that might, 
you know, be, I don't know how much it will, will smooth the, uh, uh, process, but it's almost gotten to the point where the judicial hearing itself has it, it, become so much kabuki theater that we could probably do away with that and just stop wasting everyone's time and 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 C-SPAN's dollars of, of broadcasting them. I don't know if it's going to help depoliticize, but at least uh, it, it doesn't seem to be functioning very well anymore. Doesn't seem to be functioning very well. That's a good uh, last note to uh, to end on. I think we're at the end of our time. Um, the materials, uh, as we promised, uh, are going to, or I think already are posted on the event website. You might have to refresh uh, your browser. Uh, there were a lot of questions that we couldn't get to on a whole host of issues. I cover some of them uh, in my, a lot of them in my book, Supreme Disorder, uh, other the writings that you can uh, come across. The Lindgren Calabresi term limits article addresses a lot of the mechanics and nuts and bolts of how this would work. Uh, uh, that article in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy is, uh, is in our materials as well. Uh, but anyway, I would like to thank the Federalist Society and the, uh, especially the, federal, the, uh, the Federalism and Separation of Powers Practice Group for organizing uh, this wonderful event. Uh, hopefully this uh, does indeed parallel some of the discussion uh, that will be had uh, if uh, President-elect Biden uh, appoints uh, this bipartisan commission. Hopefully there are some transition team members uh, uh, watching this or, or that will we'll get this to, to discuss it. Um, and I think with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank